Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, we're rejoining the open session of the Advisory Council, NHGRI's Advisory Council. We're going to have our last uh, concept uh, presented. Uh, this will be by uh, Adam Felsenfeld, Program Director in the Division of Genome Sciences. And the concept of his title is Molecular Phenotypes of Null Allele in Cells Pilot Project. Adam, go ahead. Thank you, Rudy, and welcome back from the break, everyone. As Rudy mentioned, I'm here to talk about a concept uh, called Molecular Phenotypes of Null Alleles in Cells, or Morphic, and I'm here speaking on behalf of a small group uh, of uh, people who worked on this, uh, and I want to extend my thanks to Colin, Ajay, and Stephanie for, for their help. Um, uh, you've all, at this point, um, uh, you've seen the published vision document. And as Eric mentioned earlier in the day, there are a number of bold predictions, um, one of which is the biological functions of every human gene will be known. Um, and there are uh, in the strategic vision, a number of compelling genomics research projects in biomedicine, uh, which follow from, from those, those ideas. Um, one of them is to acquire an increasingly comprehensive view of the roles and relationships of genes and regulatory elements and pathways and networks. And when you drill down into the compelling projects language, you find this, uh, that there's an unprecedented opportunity to decipher individual and combined worlds of each gene and regulatory element. And then this must start with establishing the function of each human gene, including the phenotypic effects of human gene knockouts. So Morphic is aimed at this. Um, it's long-term goal. It's easier for me to talk about the long-term goal. This particular concept is for only a phase one, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, but the long-term goal is to create a catalog of molecular and cellular phenotypes of null alleles for essentially all genes uh, in human. Um, these would be assayed in vitro. There are a couple of key ideas here. The first is that the phenotypes are intended to be consistent in the sense that a similar depth, breadth, and quality of information will, will be collected for each gene. This will make it easier to use the data for analyses. The second key idea is that the effort should be comprehensive with respect to genes. Note that we can conceive of even more comprehensive efforts at an extreme, for example, all alleles of all genes and all cell types with all assays, but this is not gonna be practical for some time. By limiting ourselves here to a single strong wheel for each gene, it's now technically possible, we think, to obtain a useful subset of this type of data across all genes with informative assays. This will be very useful for interpreting data about other alleles in other contexts, as I'll expand on in a bit. This concept envisages that these assays will be done in cells and as informative as possible regarding the cellular and molecular phenotypes. We anticipate this means multicellular systems, uh, such as organ lines. The concept also anticipates that, at least for phase one, the focus will be on protein coding genes. Even with these constraints, this is a challenging problem. We think that the basic ingredients are available, but don't know which are the best in terms of information and scalability, including capacity for lower costs per gene. In a phase one with a target of 1,000 genes, we think we can learn this. Here's just a high-level view so you know what we mean by phase one. I'll show this again later in the presentation to discuss the details, but the idea here is that today's concept is just for this phase. If it's approved and successful, we might be returning in several years to discuss what to do after that, but we need a phase one to develop a pipeline and to answer some basic questions about cost, throughput, technical challenges, data utility, and interpretability, data quality, standards, formats, what the best assays are, and a host of other uh, challenges. Just to justify some of the choices here, why null alleles, uh, those that produce no functional protein, we propose them here as homozygotes for several reasons beyond what I just mentioned about constraining the question to useful subset of the functional uh, problem. First, we know how to engineer, engineer them fairly reliably. Second, because they're likely to be highly penetrant and expressive, uh, it will be easier to see molecular and cellular phenotypes. Third, it's long established that null alleles are useful interp for interpreting other alleles in the same gene uh, or interpreting similar phenotypes seen for other genes. Fourth, the results will be complementary to the extensive gene knockout phenotype data from the Knockout Mouse Project, which has anatomical and physiological data, but little molecular and cellular data. Null alleles do have drawbacks, including the possibility that they will be so highly pleiotropic that interpretation will be complicated. 
It's hard to know in advance whether this pleiotropy will be useful or will be confusing in this setting. Phase one can inform that. This concept also envisages, envisages that these assays will be done in cells and in a way that is informative as possible regarding the phenotypes. We, again, we think this means multicellular systems such as organoids, which will afford the possibility of displaying phenotypes that are more faithful to the ones seen, seen in whole organisms. They have the potential to allow assays across multiple cell types in order to capture more aspects of the function of a particular gene, including features related, for example, to cell autonomy or cell specific function. Some general benefits. Um, we are missing functional information for many genes. Morphic seeks to establish a consistent base level for all. Even for genes where we do know the associated or an associated anatomical or physiological phenotype and for which we have some molecular phenotypes like expression data, there's usually a gap between the two that we don't understand as well. Morphic will provide data that can help fill that gap. Finally, the question of how NHGRI will go beyond uh, uh, correlation and prediction to mechanism is an idea that's come up several times in recent functional genomics meetings. Cellular and molecular data in multicellular systems can help with this. These data will also inform molecular and cellular pathways, of course. Some additional benefits. Another source of data for making inferences about function in association studies and other gene function or perturbation studies. There's potential for the data to be quantitative, which will allow for improved analyses. Um, consistency of information is nice uh, when doing analyses. And this project may yield other deliverables in addition to the knowledge generated, including, for example, cell lines uh, or analysis tools or computational tools. There are some challenges. The success of phase one depends on how well it informs our ability to address these. First, can mutagenesis scale? We think this is at a stage that can now be pushed. There are commercially available knockout iPSCs. There are existing libraries of CRISPR gene knockouts. We'll need to be alert to some potential challenges, including off-target effects, genetic compensation, and maybe some others. Some of these are just to be avoided, uh, but others could be informative, and a scaled effort could serve to characterize them more completely. It is not possible to assay uh, every cell type, but enough cell types need to be assayed to see an interpretable effect for every gene. We think there are likely to be creative solutions uh, to some of these challenges, possibly through scaling or multiplexing assays, um, cascade testing, and prioritizing assays based on known spatial expression, maybe others. Another potential challenge, again, is the problem of uh, uninterpretable pleiotropy or even cell lethality, especially with homozygous knockouts. How often will we see uninterpretably severe phenotypes? Um, we think there are probably creative ways to deal with this when it happens, including testing heterozygotes or testing other loss of function alleles. We expect there to be effects of genetic background that will be identified in this context as well. Phase one should assess the possible range of these effects and how to address them. For the scope of phase one, we propose a four-year project with three components that I'll describe in a couple of slides from now to develop the elements of the resource. The objective, again, will be to demonstrate the scalability of all aspects of morphic, of making alleles, of developing high throughput, yet informative assays. In phase one, we expect to learn about prospects for improvement of cost, throughput, and utility of assays. We think that a phase one target of 1,000 protein coding genes will be adequate to do this. The FOA and the funded investigators will have to consider how genes will be prioritized. There are multiple ways this could be done, some suggested here. Um, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna say which one of these will be, uh, uh, but um, they're, because there are a variety of them and, and they have their merits, all have their merits. So for example, an available comp knockout for the gene could be a criterion, known or suspected human disease gene, um, genes with relatively unknown function, uh, deliberately taking a deliberately diverse set in terms of, for example, protein class or tissue to make sure that phase one uh, is testing the limits. Again, there are others and they're not mutually exclusive. Phase one will also have to develop standards, uh, for example, for mutation QC, assay comparison and data formats. Comparing assays is a key activity for phase one because we need that information to know what to choose for phase two. The scale of phase one is not enough to be thorough, uh, thorough in incorporating diverse samples, but it is enough to learn how to be systematic in the context of this project and to apply to phase, one, phase two. Uh, one way would be simply to sample a spread of populations among the phase one assays. Um, and we'll probably need some overlap in the genes tested between different population backgrounds. 
Another aspect of, the, of phase one is to start to use the data and analyses to inform production and see how the data perform in those analyses. So the best data types, data formats, and applications. There are always details about data that only become apparent uh, once someone tries to use it. This can be a scientific issue, but it can also be a technical issue, for example, about metadata or formats. And finally, a uh, phase one goal is to develop data infrastructure. And that's all just summarized in an expanded version of the slide I showed earlier. Um, as with any phase one, we need expectations for success. This list of things that I just talked about is not a comprehensive one, um, but raises, I, I hope raises most of them. Um, again, they're all aimed at the question, is a phase two technically possible? Is it justified and what's the best structure? What are the best assays? How much is it gonna cost? The program structure that follows from the scope is straightforward. We propose three components that will work in a consortium. All will use a cooperative agreement mechanism and all are proposed for a duration of four years. The first of those components are data production centers. Um, they would lead the prioritization of phase one genes, decide on overlap and testing, develop plans for comparison between assays. They would engineer the alleles, they would carry out their proposed assays, submit the data to component three, which I'll get to in a minute, and lead a discussion about data standards and validation of alleles and costs per gene. Component two will be data, oh, and I should say that we propose that, um, that as four to six centers, we definitely need multiple centers here up to $1.4 million per year each for four years. Component two would be data analysis and validation centers, uh, two to three awards up to half a million dollars total per year each. Um, the key idea, again, is to get people using the data so they can identify your issues early and then feed that back to the consortium. Um, analyses could be anything related to the key analytic issues, pathway analysis, pleiotropy, cell type inference, aiding interpretation of other functional data sets or association studies, and others are certainly possible. And again, mostly they should be designed to eliminate key issues with the data utility. Analysis centers are also likely to identify new deliverables that we didn't anticipate of high interest to the community. And we'll have to think about those as they arise. And that's happened in other programs. The third component that we propose is a data resource. Funding ideally would be structured to meet demand, meaning that it would the amount of money would ramp up uh, to be commensurate with the amount of data that's available. Um, this uh, component, there would be one of them, would receive, wrangle, annotate, and present data for the consortium and community use, lead discussions about data formats and requirements, integrate data from data production centers, and pursue opportunities to integrate with similar, excuse me, or complementary resources. Um, this is a component that would be leading efforts to integrate with complementary resources, for example, integration with, uh, with the Knockout Mouse project regarding how to combine and present data on gene orthologs that are knocked out in both the mouse and human systems, for example, um, and also bring into the Morphic Consortium lessons learned from those other projects that are relevant. Um, the third component would also be the Consortium Logistics Center um, and help with communications and tracking, uh, tracking progress. We know that in the long term, we need to be looking for opportunities to integrate data resources handling similar kinds of data, but certainly something like this will be needed uh, quite proximate to the consortium uh, in the near term. Um, we always talk about relationship to other studies. Um, we think that morphic data will be valuable on their own, but are likely to be most useful in combination with other functional variant association data to provide insight into gene function and mechanisms of phenotype. There are clear relationships and connections to other projects. They're mostly complementary. There might be some overlap. The ones here are just examples, so disease association studies and Mendelian and common disease, uh, clinical studies or resources that interpret variants. Uh, and other knockout studies such as COMP. It's not at all hard to imagine uh, some of these interactions, um, but more detail will require more specific planning between efforts. Again, there's an obvious connection in particular to COMP here, uh, which has the anatomical and physiological knockout phenotypes, but not so much the molecular and cellular ones. In addition to having, uh, they've also thought carefully about an overlapping set of issues um, and could be useful in prioritizing genes as well as thinking about appropriate assays. 
So in summary, the long-term goal is to catalog of molecular and cellular phenotypes of null alleles for all human genes in vitro. Phase one would develop a pipeline, assess barriers to scale, address challenges, and would entail a thousand genes in, over four years. As for structure, four to six data production centers, three analysis centers, and a data resource. Fairly straightforward. And before uh, I hand it over for questions, I want to thank my many colleagues who worked on this for extensive input on ideas and, uh, and the presentation. So now we're on to questions. And uh, I've asked uh, Dr. Chung, Dr. Eidecker, and Dr. Chang to lead off the discussion. So Adam, would you like to take down your slides so that we get a sure. full gallery view? Thank you. Should I lead off, Adam? Yes, please. Okay. So I'm still a little bit trying to get my head around this concept. Obviously, it has uh, potential utility in this, a lot of utility. It's a big, to me, it's big in terms of scope, you know, 10 million per year for the four years. And I'll be very interested to see in this pilot phase exactly how it works um, because there's so many complexities. And when I think about which genes to prioritize, and obviously the those who apply will make these decisions, but you know, there are all sorts of dimensions you could have genes that are known to be associated with disease has some utility, but also genes that we don't know what they do have completely different, but also utility in there. And when I just think about the humans, they're so complicated to me in terms of both by time and development, by organ system, by that is by tissue, but even cells within organs, there's such heterogeneity. I'm trying to get sort of my head wrapped around how do you have this single platform with single cell types so you can do the cross comparisons, but yet have the relevant ones for individual genes. And so that's what I'm still trying to think to myself, how that, how's that going to work and how's that going to be useful in these ways? knowing and also um, you know, trying to think about nulls work or homozygous nulls work for some diseases, but probably not others, and trying to think of the complexity of, I, I get the idea to do knockouts, but you, would you look at heterozygotes and homozygotes? Would you do that based on the human genetics or what we know about tolerance for haploinsufficiency or um, you know, what we know about mouse models and in comp? And anyway, I'm just sort of, those are all the things really in my head and it's, it's very complicated. So I'm sure the first pilot phase will help us to understand that complexity and the value, but uh, I just see the potential for a lot of complexity. Yeah, thank you. And I, I agree about the complexity um, and, uh, and one of the, yeah, one of the challenges of, of writing an RFA is to make sure that we, we um, focus applicants on answering those questions. Um, so any advice that you could give me on on ways to do that, uh, be grateful for. Okay, we've got Howard, Trey, and then Raphael. Go ahead, Howard. Uh, Adam, thank you so much for this presentation. I'm quite positive about this idea. I think this will really fill an important gap and, and really expand our knowledge of genes that are both familiar and unknown uh, to the genomics community. Uh, I think there are several important considerations. First, you already highlighted the fact that the null phenotype depends on a genetic background. And so uh, we spent this morning talking about diversity. And so it's important that in the pilot phase, we test several different genetic backgrounds. We don't wanna just kind of lock in a single resource just for only one genotype. And equally important, obviously, males, females, XX versus XY genotypes uh, should be tested in the pilot phase. This just gives a sense of really how different could the outcome be if you have a different genetic background to start with, right? That'll give you a sense of how much of a dimension that parameter needs to be. The second point is that the so-called null allele, it may not be as straightforward as people think. And I would highlight that perhaps in the uh, kind of the, the RFA or when you think about it, it can't just be a conceptually, this would not turn into a protein, therefore it is a null, we believe it's a null. There are already research showing that in certain cases, uh, uh, a mutant RNA can actually trigger compensation of other gene family members, whereas if you don't make the RNA at all, then that doesn't happen. So actually documenting what, what actually happened to the perturbation to the target gene of, of, in question is very important to interpret the results. Uh, and I think that the third uh, aspect, a question came up as to what, what cell type or organ system should people focus on? One possible impact of this work is that 
these data, these cells will serve as a reference point uh, for a, a lot of kinds of research. And so perhaps then cell types and tissues are very accessible in, from patients like blood or skin or something like that would be something you want to emphasize because then that is something that people can then obtain from individuals and compare against data generated from the morphic uh, resource. Thank you. Okay, Do Trey, Raphael, and Hal. Thanks, Rudy. So, so I wrote down three considerations, Adam, and they cover the gamut of scientific and programmatic issues. They're kind of all over the map. One of them follows up on, on Wendy's comment about phase one and, and really trying to nail down what it can achieve. So, so one consideration is how, how uh, exactly can you, can you set now your standards for evaluation of phase one when it's complete? What, is, what does success look like? Does it mean, you know, of those thousand genes, 80% have been linked to some phenotype? Is that, is that success? Um, whereas if, you know, less than half fail to show a phenotype by any assay you throw at it, that's failure. Uh, is, yeah. is that the way to think about this? Or, you know, how are you thinking about it? it that's, Trey, that's question one. Yeah, Trey, it's a combination. I can answer. Directly. Yeah, yeah, we can do this in order and a sort of Socratic method too. So please. Okay, yeah. sorry, yeah. So so I've been thinking about this a lot. I, I think there's two things. One is it's useful to have a number of, of successes, but, uh, or percent percentage. But it's, it's actually much better just to, no matter what percentage you have, you understand uh, why you succeeded and why you failed. And that's really, that's harder to state quantitatively, but that's really what I'm looking for is, is insight into why things work and why things don't work. Right, right. And just one, one scientific note, this is probably the least important of my comments, but, but one interesting note that I, I thought of when I was thinking about what what phenotypes would you really look for to be guaranteed success? You know, I thought Uri Geiger has this paper from over 10 years ago um, with, with the title Uncovering a Phenotype for All Genes, where she looked in yeast and it turned out by the time she had looked at 1100 different chemical compounds and all she scored was growth, by the way, she found a phenotype for 97% of yeast chains. Now I realize yeast and people are very different but I would point out that yeast do have a complete genome duplication. So any, any suspicions that pyrology might have confounded your efforts, somehow, in fact, those, those paralogs, according to her, have, have diversified, um, even for simple uh, phenotypes like growth in, in different conditions. So, so that actually augurs well for, for this effort, if, if, any, if yeast can be any, any judge. Um, but now to my last point. So, so you did mention that um, there's these connections to other, other efforts, um, such as IGBF. And in fact, IGBF, I, I had thought of as sort of an umbrella effort almost to which this would be a special instance. And so, so do you, uh, I, I'm guessing you're going to disagree this is a special instance of IGBF, but maybe we can talk about in what ways it is or it is not. For instance, could someone propose to IGVF this exact type of project where they're gonna blow in and delete every gene? Or, or does the language, I, I, I might remember the language prohibits a complete gene deletion in the IGVF program. Maybe you could just comment on to whether this is distinct or this is like a, a special instance of, of an IGVF type of a project. Yeah, that's a hard that's a hard question, and uh, I'm actually going to call on uh, Stephanie if she's able to um, she's able to weigh in about whether or not uh, IGVF specifically precludes this because I just I'm sorry I I can't remember. But Trey, I I um, in terms of the my understanding is is far from perfect, and I'm also going to ask. Uh, Mike Pazin to weigh in here, especially if I if I say the wrong thing. Um, IG, IGVF, um, my understanding of what it admits is is um, is broader, and um, and because of that is um, is less likely to be comprehensive in any one dimension. Um, so I I don't know if you could look at it as an umbrella. 
uh, but there's there's clearly a, a, con a continuum. So Adam, I'm gonna have Dan speak because he is one of our panelists. I'm not sure if Mike or okay. um, <clears throat> or Stephanie are. So Dan, can you, Sharon pointed out the good point. Can you define what IGVF is? And then we can come back to the specifics of this. And I just wanna clarify, you know, IGVF is a as an approved concept, the applications are in and that's sort of moving forward. I do think the sort of, to your point, Trey, understanding how they relate is an important question that's slightly different from adjudicating. No, that, that's the spirit of my question. Yeah, so Dan, do you wanna go ahead? Sure, sure. So to the question of what IGVF is, this is a program that we're starting up that's looking at the impact of genomic variation on function. Considering genomic variation very broadly, um, and so what Trey said to the effect that morphic could be a very specific, or parts of morphic could be a very specific subset of what's covered in IGVF, I think that it is true. Um, there could be components of IGVF grants that are looking at some knockouts, but whole gene knockouts, but would not be looking um, as comprehensively as morphic is. And, and whole gene knockouts is not uh, the focus of the type of variation that IGVF will be looking at. Does that help clarify things? Well, but it's likely that people will make nonsense mutations, right, <laughs> in frame shifts, so. So, yeah, so, so it I sounds what, like this could have been proposed for IGBF. Sorry, Carolyn. Oh, no, that's what I was going to say, Trey, is I think, I think if this had been proposed for IGBF, and those applications are to states that we can't even really talk in great detail about what was proposed or what wasn't proposed, you know, in the process of that, you, some things would be null alleles, but the real focus there is on looking more specifically at variation. And I variation. think the key point to Dan's is the level of characterization, functional characterization of the null allele that's being pro proposed here in morphic wouldn't be in scope for what something's that's being done. So we have the connections and working together on this for how these relate. So yes, something like this could have been responsive, but I don't think that the full, the, the dimension of this, to your earlier point about going in different dimensions, this is going much in a deeper dimension on really understanding function of genes as opposed to impacts of variation. So, so maybe and I know it, those are tied I, together concepts, but there's key parts about them that are distinct. And Trey, I, I sometimes think about this as a, a morphic as a way to run ahead in one dimension of all the various different perturbation by various different phenotype, et cetera, kinds of experiments you could do. And something that could be put in place uh, in, in a relatively finite period of time that would be extremely useful, again, for broadly for interpreting these kinds of data. Yeah, so maybe clarifying language like like Adam, you and Carolyn just spoke would be would be one thing you could put into the the language of the of, of the program if you haven't already. Happy okay, to. were you done, Trey? Okay, uh, Raphael, and then Hal. Go ahead, Rafi. Thanks. So this question is similar to the one some of us raised about IGBF, and it's. I would like to hear a little bit about the rationale for having this be a consortia, given how complex and how many dimensions there are and how hard it's going to be to decide among all those uh, dimensions and possibilities as a, as a big group. Uh, I want to hear a little bit about the rationale for having a consortium instead of at the first stage, just letting every investigator do what they want to do on their own and see what works maybe from there uh, decide later to do something more organized. Yeah, yeah. so I, I think that in order to, so, so first it's not a huge consortium. I don't consider this to be a huge consortium. Um, but I think, I think that you sort of need a captive audience and, and that means cooperative agreements and, and being able 
preparing people to, to really sit down and hash out the advantages and disadvantages of the complementarities of their systems and uh, to have enough different kinds of data that you can get people together in, in one place and talk about, um, talk about mundane but key things like, um, like data formats and QC and do things like force people to test the same gene in multiple systems, which might not be advocated by, by all. Um, and, um, and also to force people to, to, you know, for example, for the, um, for doing diverse samples to make sure everyone's working on the same, uh, the same range of diverse samples. Um, so I, I think, I, I, I think that um, you need something in between just having people go be off on their own and, and trying this for a while. Um, so that's, I think, the primary reason why I think this should be a consortium. Okay, Hal and then Sharon. So um, Wendy um, nicely introduced the concept of complexity, but I think it was only the tip of the iceberg. Um, in these types of systems, um, it's not going to make much sense, for example, to look at a receptor knockout when the ligand for that receptor is missing from the system. Um, with regard to the complexity of null alleles, even with nonsense mutations, some alleles will be subject to mRNA decay and no protein production, where others will make truncated proteins with gain of function. So, you know, I think that it's, it's going to be imperative um, that wise choices are made um, regarding the genes, uh, alleles, cell types, and contexts that are studied. And I'm, I'm just not sure that the same groups that will be best at um, assuring efficient production of these alleles and cell lines um, are going to be the ones that would make the most informed choices uh, regarding all that level of complexity. Um, I'm wondering if there was consideration of having a mechanism for the broader community to nominate genes, cell types, alleles, and contexts for study in this initiative. Um, I, I think that would um, be a better way of assuring um, success uh, it it's also should be noted um, that cellular phenotypes um, in artificial contexts will often give you results that are true and yet irrelevant um, to normal cell biology, uh, physiology, or pathologic disease contexts. So um, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I... I... You know, I started with, uh, I think it's a good idea. Uh, and I agree with you about, again, about the com potential complexity here. Um, a, a pilot with a thousand, with a thousand genes that then there's some overlap. Um, and, uh, and then you, even a community nomination process needs, probably needs some, has, has to have some direction to make sure there's a diversity a diversity of factors that are tested. Um, it does, I think it can be done. It probably would start to cut into the, to the thousand, the number of thousand, but maybe that's not so important if it probably can learn quite a lot from 500, um, maybe as much as you could learn from a thousand. So um, I think that that's a good idea. Uh, have to think about it. You know, I, I might argue that you could learn more from 250 good choices than a thousand bad choices. Sharon. Well, I was going in the same direction of how, as how, but came to a slightly different conclusion, which is, I, I do think there's the issue of making the alleles, which is sort of right in NHGRI's wheelhouse. There's the issue of doing all of the cellular phenotyping, which is really a much broader biology question. And, you know, by your emphasis on organoids, you know, people are probably going to make these alleles and IPCs and you're going to need experts in differentiating into different cell types to really get any kind of reasonable assay. 
So I worry a little bit. I mean, it may just be that people will team up, but I worry a little bit the way it's written. There's so much emphasis on the engineering. And I think really a lot of the work's going to be figuring out a set of, I don't know, 20 or 50 neurologic disease genes and then getting experts in those organoids versus another set of 20 or 50 cardiovascular genes and getting experts in cardiovascular physiology or organoids that I'm just a little worried the way it's structured, you're gonna have, you're not gonna have the expertise you need to um, really set these systems up as well as you could. And so I would think carefully as you really write the details of the RFA, the degree of expertise you're gonna need in these different physiological systems, in addition to groups that are just experts in cell cycle analysis and metabolism that will probably cut across many cell types. I, I did appreciate how you referenced COMP. I would say COMP has been, a, and I'll bring this up to the end about data visualization. COMP has put a lot of effort into data visualization of these kinds of phenotypes, which I think have been quite effective. And so it would really be nice to see that, um, uh, and I'm somewhat biased here because Baylor, Baylor's part of COMP, but not so much part of the data visualization part. Um, but I do think it would be important to, to kind of benefit from what they've learned about visualizing this type of data for the community to use it. Lynn. Thank you. I, I guess my sense is that it's going to be harder to find a phenotype than you expect. And, you know, you need some kind of triage process or alternatively a top-down process. Like, is it prohibited to suggest you want to knock out 10 contiguous genes all at once and then do the experiment and see if you even see anything in all your assays? Because if you don't, or a hundred genes or a thousand genes, right? I mean, you can just go, these CAS CRISPR systems are very easy to make big deletions. And so I guess, is that out of play if somebody said, that's another way I can tackle this or it doesn't really have to be individual gene nulls? No, no I, I, I think that the, the, the trick is to leave it as flexible as possible and still get the answer. And if that's a good way to get the answer, we don't wanna, right, we don't wanna foreclose on that. Other comments or questions for Adam or the team? Okay, that's enough time for people to find the mute button. So let's forge ahead. Can I get a motion to approve the concept? A second? All in favor? Thank you. All opposed? Was your hand up there, Sharon? It was so quick. Oh, we can't hear you, Sharon. Okay, hand is up. Hal, you also opposed? Anyone else? Three. Okay, anyone abstaining? Four. Anyone abstaining? Okay, thank you very much. And thank you, Adam. Thank you.